This sleepy-looking fish is Kevin McCarthy. He's the majority leader of the House, and right now he is desperately trying to get one of his fellow Republicans to stop making a scene at the worst possible time. Joe Biden bringing the country Stand together. Up and show them. In the United States, Congress consists of two bodies, the House of Representatives and the Senate. All states have two senators. Running for the Senate means running in a statewide election. Your constituency will consist of the entire state, and the decision as to whether to play to a base or towards a broader public is more likely to lean towards the broader public since you require a majority of votes to get elected. However, members of the House of Representatives are voted in by only members of their district. This means that the senators, having to appeal to a wider range of voters, have to have the ability to communicate both to their voting base and to the general public. This also means that the members of the House only have to appeal to the voters in their district which tend to be more exaggerated in terms of red, blue, etc. Because of the fewer numbers of senators, their votes are worth more individually, and so the senators are more powerful per person. They're generally seen as a bigger deal. Some members of the House and Senate are more important than others because they sit on special committees. Members of the House who are on important House committees often have as much focus on them as a senator who doesn't sit on a lot of important committees. The best committee assignments and therefore the ones with the most attention paid to them. Generally go to representatives who are either experienced enough to have learned what they're doing, or are new, impressive, and seem destined for greater things. Beyond even that, there's the leader of the whole House of Representatives, called the Speaker of the House. The Speaker is supposed to have the political savviness of a veteran congressperson, as well as the force of personality necessary to control their party. But then sometimes, one of them simply fails up. Kevin McCarthy got his start in politics proper on the staff of Congressman Bill Thomas from 1987 till 2002. But he made his entrance onto the national stage in 2000. 2006, when Bill Thomas retired and McCarthy ran for his former boss's seat. He has won re-election, largely uncontested since then, and with diminishing percentage of the vote each time. To get elected, he has never had to appeal to people outside of his district. McCarthy was never politically savvy. In fact, he was never terribly bright. He does have the benefit of being vaguely aware of it. One of the main strengths of the GOP is that their voters generally aren't aware of the actual legislation they're passing. Most Republicans know this. That's what lets them pretend they're fending off hordes of ravenous brown people while they're secretly finding every possible way to give more money to their rich friends. Most of them don't realize, when you get onto a national stage, how important it is to keep pushing the party line without giving away what they're actually trying to do. Because the party doesn't actually care about the things they pretend to care about, they run into dangerous territory when one of them, usually one of the young bucks, usually someone who's only used to appealing to one district, gets lost in the moment and forgets which is the party line and which is their actual intention. Here's McCarthy learning that lesson in 2015. The question question I think you really want to ask me is, how am I going to be different? What are you going to see I love how you ask my questions, but go ahead. That was one of my questions. Go right ahead. Well, I knew you'd want to ask it. What you're going to see is a conservative speaker that takes a conservative Congress that puts a strategy to fight and win. And let me give you one example. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Her numbers are dropping. Why? Because she's untrustable. But no one would have known any of that had happened had we not agree. fought and That's made that happen. That's something good. I give you so credit for that. I give you okay, credit so for why- Benghazi was a coordinated attack against two government facilities of the United States that were located in Benghazi, Libya, by members of an Islamic militant group, Ansar al-Sharia. Just like our own domestic terrorists do at home, they used a protest as cover. There were ten investigations into the Benghazi attacks. Six of them were by Republican-controlled congressional committees. And they did not find in all of those investigations that anyone from the Obama administration had acted improperly. Republicans were accused of wasting American taxpayer dollars for political stunts. Kevin McCarthy was presumed to become the speaker to replace John Boehner in 2015. But after letting the cat out of the bag about Benghazi, he had to withdraw from that race because he had demonstrated that he did not have the ability 
to spout Republican talking points while hiding the Republican agenda. That is what Republicans do on a national stage. That is what leadership in the party must do in order to keep their scam going. My, oh my, what a wonderful day. I used to sing that on my way to work in the morning. Listen, uh, my mission uh, every day is to fight for a smaller, less costly, and more accountable government. And uh, you meet rich people, you meet poor people, you meet interesting people, and eh, probably a few boring ones along the way. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of the people I meet uh, on the road, anywhere, uh, could, not be, uh, could not be nicer uh, than, uh, than they've been. It's, uh, it's, been, it's been, really, it's been wonderful. Uh, it's been an honor to serve in this institution. And with that, how would you be different as speaker compared to Mr. Brown? Just be careful. I'm standing right there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be as tan. <laughs> there you go. Um, look, John is a very I good... Hillary Clinton man. was unbeatable, right? But we put together a Benghazi special committee, a select committee. What are her numbers today? Paul Ryan is the new Speaker of the House, and in the end, after all the wrangling, people dropping out of the race, the gaffes, the deals, the people saying they're not going to make deals and then making deals, it wasn't even close. He won by a landslide. So we're going to give you some more details on that in just a second. First, here is a taste of the new Speaker. But let's be frank. The House is broken. We're not solving problems. We're adding to them. And I am not interested in laying blame. We are not settling scores. We are wiping the slate clean. Today, dramatic news involving the Speaker of the House. Cenk? Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Down goes Ryan! Down goes Ryan! Down goes Paul Ryan! Okay. Come on, you know you look forward to that. No! <laughs> I wanted him to go down in November. I wanted him I to know. lose. I know. Because he is a deficit hawk. That is his reputation. Yeah. His reputation since the beginning. And you'll be shocked to find out that the uh, CBO is now projecting as of this week that the deficit is going to reach $1 trillion by 2020. That happened in record time under his watch with Donald Trump. In the months following Trump's victory, he began contemplating the scenarios for his departure. More recently, over closely held conversations with his kitchen cabinet, Ryan's preference had become clear. He'd like to serve throughout the rest of this cycle and uh, retire ahead of the next Congress. This would give Ryan a final legislative year to chase the second white whale. Entitlement reform, which we've heard is something they were going to turn to. Democrats roared this week, crushing Donald Trump with this blue wave. They netted more than 40 years worth of House seats, more than any other election since the Democratic wave against Nixon, who was historically unpopular because of his criminal Carolyn presidency. Carolyn instructs me to say the following. I am now ready to take the oath of office. I ask the Dean of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Don Young, to administer the oath of office to speak. Welcome to the Majority Report's continuing coverage of the House Intelligence Committee impeachment, public impeachment hearings. Impeachment resolution has been uh, released and it will be voted upon tomorrow, is my understanding. Two weeks ago, Republicans were condemning Donald Trump after the deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol. Now, some already appear to be softening their stance, rolling it back. The latest example, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. He met with the former president at his Florida resort yesterday. It's a turnaround for McCarthy, who is backing off his previous statement that Trump, quote, bared responsibility for the siege. You're never going to make the White House press corps happy with anything. They, they were not happy uh, during the Trump administration, Obama administration, Biden administration. They always want more time uh, with the president and to field more questions. But I'm just happy that he was out there fielding those questions on what was actually a pretty good day after the election for Democrats. And it looks more likely that Republicans might just have two seats uh, in uh, of a majority in the House of Representatives. That's a terrible night for Republicans. The tea I am drinking while we watch uh, the GOP uh, uh, lie in the bed they've made is a delicious latte. It's a it's a fine way to get a little uh, get a little milk and caffeine.
Whoa, they just said they want to adjourn until noon? Motion of the gentleman from Oklahoma. Those in favor say They don't have a deal. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. Even by modern American political standards, Anna, even by... Um, the standards of what we've seen over the course of the past uh, extraordinary week uh, as they tried to elect a speaker. Uh, the past few hours have been utterly uh, extraordinary. Uh, it, it is still unfolding uh, in uh, the chamber of the House of Representatives. Uh, it was only a few moments ago that um, Kevin McCarthy was confirmed after, as you say, 15 rounds of voting that stretches back four days. He was confirmed as the third most powerful politician in America, uh, second in line to the presidency after the vice president, the speaker of the US House of Representatives. You can see Kevin McCarthy there as the camera pans out. Uh, Matt Gates is there sitting down in the grey suit. Uh, these two have a, a conversation uh, for a period of time. Uh, and uh, remember that over the course of the past 14 uh, votes, uh, Kevin McCarthy has been conceding uh, to these fringe politicians to get them to vote with him, uh, giving them uh, all sorts of concessions, which will become clear over the course of the next few uh, hours, I would think, and will probably put Kevin McCarthy in somewhat of a straitjacket in terms of his ability to be able to govern. The New York Times is taking a look at how House Speaker Kevin McCarthy rose to power with a little help from an unlikely ally. Days after winning the gavel, McCarthy reportedly gushed to a friend about the ironclad bond he had developed with far-right Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. According to that friend who spoke to the Times on the condition of anonymity, McCarthy said, quote, I will never leave that woman. I will always take care oh, of her. Good Lord. Oh, my God. The Times notes that the relationship between McCarthy and Greene was born of political expediency, but fueled by genuine camaraderie and nurtured by one-on-one -on -one meetings, often once a week, usually at a coffee table in McCarthy's Capitol office. A lot of details here. Well, as a constant stream of text messages back and forth. McCarthy has gone to unusual lengths to defend Marjorie Taylor Greene. When her Twitter account was shut down for violating COVID misinformation policy, she demanded that McCarthy fix it. Over the next two months, McCarthy's general counsel would spend hours on the phone with Twitter execs. What? Arguing her what? case. Kevin McCarthy understands how someone from a bright red district can be prone to letting slip what the actual Republican agenda is. So during Joe Biden's 2023 State of the Union address, Kevin McCarthy knew what a dangerous moment it was when Biden directly called out the fact that Republicans were attempting to remove Social Security. Some of my Republican friends want to take the economy hostage. I get it, unless I agree to their economic plans. All of you at home should know what those plans are. Instead of making the wealthy pay their fair share, some Republicans, some Republicans want Medicare and Social Security to sunset. I'm not saying it's a majority. <laughs> Let me give you, anybody who doubts it, contact my office. I'll give you a copy. I'll give you a copy of the proposal. They use coded language like sunsetting or entitlement reform. But what it comes down to is trying to get rid of Social Security. Older Americans love Social Security. The vast majority of Republicans are older voters. Kevin McCarthy knew he can't have their voters actually understanding what they're trying to do. That means the worst thing that could have possibly happened to him during Joe Biden's 2023 State of the Union address is that Joe Biden could draw attention to it and that his own party could make that moment memorable. Now look at this desperate shush from McCarthy. The idea is that we're not going to be we're not going to be moved into being threatened to default on the debt if we don't respond. He knows enough to be panicked here, and this time he erred too far on the other side. Last time he let the cat out of the bag, this time he shoved that cat so far into the bag that he accidentally committed the House of Representatives to supporting Social Security. So folks, as we all apparently agree, Social Security and Medicare is off the, off the books now, right? They're not to be sponsored. All right. I'm ready. We got unanimity. S 
Social Security and Medicare are a lifeline for millions of seniors. Americans have to pay into them from the very first paycheck they started. So tonight, let's all agree, and apparently we are, let's stand up for seniors. Stand up and show them. We will not cut Social Security. We will not cut Medicare. Those benefits belong to the American people. They earned it. And if anyone tries to cut Social Security, which apparently no one's going to do, and if anyone tries to cut Medicare, I'll stop them. I'll veto it. And look, I'm not going to allow them to take away, be taken away. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. But apparently, it's not going to be a problem. Now, of course, they're there to steal from the American people. So they're still going to try to cut Social Security. But now when they do, now when they do, their hypocrisy will be on full display because there is a memorable clip that played in the media of all of them, including the leader of the House, giving a standing ovation to protecting Social Security. Joe Biden bringing the country Stand together. Stand up and show them. We'll not cut Social Security. We will not cut Medicare. One reason I like the House of Representatives, it shows who the core of the party really is. Right now, MAGA, which is the new Republican Party, they stand for nothing except their own enrichment, their own career goals. They're a collection of hateful con artists, and the most responsible one in that crew, the most responsible member of the GOP in the House of Representatives, is Kevin McCarthy. And thank God, he still can't play the game. Joe Biden was a senator. Joe Biden's been in politics for 50 years. There's a whole lot I don't like about Joe Biden, but one thing I do like about him, he does know how to play the game. And Joe Biden played MAGA. Oh, they're still going to try to get rid of Social Security. I mean, they have to. They are obstructionists, after all. What are they if they're not obstructing something? They don't have a belief system, but that is their playbook. Attack the decent at all opportunities. That's MAGA. It's always been the GOP, but they used to be subtle about it. Now, now, subtlety's gone. Fortunately, with subtlety out the window, it is now easier for America to see what they're really all about. So when they come back for Social Security, when they try to kill it, one way or another, we can play that clip. We can play Kevin McCarthy panicking and joining the standing ovation, and we can show America that these people say one thing and mean another. They call Joe Biden Brandon, as in let's go Brandon, as in a, a cheap insult that comes from the NASCAR world to tell him they hate him. Lefties, whenever Biden started fighting back against the GOP, using their stupidity against them, they started calling him Dark Brandon. I don't like Joe Biden all that much, but I'll tell you, I love Dark Brandon. You know, I also noticed a fair amount of Republicans standing up last night and clapping. You know, for example, when I pointed out that um, some Republicans were talking about eliminating Medicare, they said, no, no, no. I said, oh, okay. That means all of you are for supporting Medicare. Everybody raise your hand. They all raise their hand. So guess what? We accomplished something. If they, unless they break their word, there's going to be no cuts in Medicare or Social Security. Yes, sir. Get them, Dark Brandon. So remember this. Remember that they showed who they really are because they are going to come back for it. And remember that if you name it, if you develop the understanding to realize what they're talking about, when they say they want to sunset things, when they say they want to engage in entitlement reform, this is what they're talking about. And they cannot stand the light of day. Their plans cannot stand exposure to the general public. And you'll find that if you delve into just about anything that Republicans are trying to do, it is the same. This is the most blatant. This is the most obvious of their schemes. But all of their schemes follow this pattern. So thank you, Dark Brandon, for exposing this. It was a hell of a move, and the man deserves credit for it. And don't forget the lesson. This is who the Republicans are, have always been, and will always be. They've just had a higher amount of political savviness before this point. And I'm satisfied with the leadership of the House, because MAGA will keep accidentally making it clear what Republicans have always been about.